So today's message is John chapter 8, and we're going to go from verse 37 all the way to 59. And the title is, Who is Your Father? And today, that might sound like a typical, uh, you know, topical sermon for Father's Day, but it's not. It's actually just what's in the passage. And I'm not smart enough to do topical sermons. So I just like to go through the Bible verse by verse. And as we do that, God lines things up. And uh, I don't even realize it. In fact, it was Wednesday. I've got the sermon coming together and a couple of title options. And I'm looking ahead and going, oh, oh, okay. One of them is about the, who's your father and, and it's Father's Day. And I just kind of clued into it halfway through the week. Uh, and I was just preparing the sermon like normal, going verse by verse. And um, by the way, that's one of the blessings at Calvary Chapel of just going verse by verse through the Bible. It's called expositional preaching or teaching. And uh, I never have to try to preach into situations that are going on in people's lives or in the world or in the church. And um, you may find sometimes that as we're talking here on Sunday morning in the sermon, something really relates to what you're going through. And that is not designed uh, by man. <laughs> uh, I'm not smart enough to do that. And I don't have cameras in your house, and I'm not spying on you or anything like that. It's just the Word of God and the Holy Spirit at work leading us and speaking to us. And so today's message is called, Who is Your Father? And you know, one of the things we might all agree on as we grow from childhood to adulthood is that without realizing it, we often begin to become like our parents. <laughs> We take on physical characteristics or we take on mannerisms like our parents. And the older you get, the more you realize it. And it's kind of scary sometimes. Um, it may be a physical feature. For instance, my dad, when I was a teenager, um, I remember we moved from England to Canada when I was 16. And I was in a really bad place. I was just very self-centered and critical. And I remember my dad, he was in his mid-40s and he had brown hair. And suddenly his sideburn area suddenly went really gray and then white before anything else changed. And I remember as a teenager just being in such a bad mood all the time thinking uh, that just doesn't look very cool. <laughs> you know, I was all into the image and all that back then. And uh, now that I'm 40, <laughs> you can guess what's starting to happen. <laughs> right here, <laughs> it's turning. And so that's maybe why I trim it kind of short right now. But I'm sure one day I'll embrace it, and, uh, and then it will take over like it, like it has for my dad, and I'll be a white hair guy. It just happened, right? Exactly. Let her go, says Scott. It's going to be. And, you know, we resemble our parents in, in many ways. And sometimes it's unconscious, but nevertheless it happens. And, you know, what's true in the physical realm is also true in the spiritual realm. The Bible tells us that as Christians, we are now children of God. And because of that, we should be becoming like our Father in heaven. Just as we take after our earthly Father, so now we should resemble more and more our Heavenly Father by our life and by our actions. And that's exactly what Jesus is going to talk about in this passage. And, and Lord willing, we'll go from 37 all the way to 59, and we'll talk about who is your Father. That's the question that every one of us needs to answer. Spiritually speaking, who is your Father? And we will see the true identity of the religious leaders, and then we'll see the true identity of Jesus. And then we'll talk about ourselves. So just to recap, Jesus is here on the Temple Mount. It's probably the day after the Feast of Tabernacles. And there's still a large crowd there in Jerusalem. And it's a mixed crowd that's come to hear him teach. Verse 30, if you look back, it says many believed in him. But we also know many in the crowd rejected Jesus. And here in John 8, we're seeing John highlight a conversation between Jesus and the Pharisees. Now, who are the Pharisees? Uh, they are the religious professionals, the uh, legalistic leaders of Judaism in Jesus' day. And many of them rejected Jesus. Why? Because they were trusting in their good works and their ability to keep the law of Moses and a bunch of other traditions that they had invented. And so when Jesus came, Jesus' message was simple. Trust in me. Believe in me. Come to me. Receive me. And you will not perish. You'll have eternal life. You'll be forgiven of your sins in a way that the law could never justify you or free you from sin. 
And Jesus would say, through me, you can know God and, and have a relationship with God, and you can go to heaven. And Jesus also said, if you do not believe in me, you will perish and die in your sins, and you'll be eternally separated from God. Now, the Pharisees didn't like that. They were very comfortable in their self-reliance, in their religion, and in their pride, and they strongly opposed Jesus. And as we'll see today in this passage, they throw some accusations and they heckle at Jesus. But it's amazing to watch how Jesus responds with grace and with truth. And he's going to make it very clear who he really is. So look back at verse 31 just to get the context. Jesus said to those Jews who believed in him, If you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed. And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. And they answered him, this is the Pharisees now, We are Abraham's descendants and have never been in bondage to anyone how can you say you will be made free? So Jesus promised freedom to those who follow him. Pharisees, they were self-deceived and they thought they were already free. We don't need a savior, but they were actually slaves to Rome. And even worse, they were slaves to sin. We covered that last time. Look at verse 34. But Jesus answered them, Most assuredly, I say to you, whoever commits sin is a slave of sin. And a slave does not abide in the house forever, but a son abides forever. Therefore, if the son makes you free, you shall be free in Indeed. So Jesus was saying, I'm the one who's come to set you free from the power of sin. And that's where we pick it up now in verse 37. Jesus said, I know that you are Abraham's descendants, and you seek to kill me because my word has no place in you. I speak what I have seen with my father, and you do what you have seen with your father. They answered and said to him, Abraham is our father. Jesus said to him, if you, or to them, if you were Abraham's children, you would do the works of Abraham. But now you seek to kill me, a man who has told you the truth, which I heard from God. Abraham did not do this. You do the deeds of your father. And we'll stop there. So Jesus said, yes, I know you are Abraham's descendants, but you're not acting like Abraham at all. In fact, you want to kill me. You're nothing like Abraham. And so Jesus points out, if you look closely at the text, there's a difference between, for the Jews, of being Abraham's descendants versus being Abraham's children. Verse 37, I know you're Abraham's descendants. Verse 39, in the middle of the verse, he said, if you were Abraham's children, you would do the works of Abraham. In other words, your genetic heritage doesn't make you right with God. Your physical DNA, your religious nationality, your culture, it doesn't make you holy, it doesn't make you saved or into a child of God like Abraham was. And so there's two kinds of children of Abraham, you might say. There's those who are genetically, but then there's those who are spiritually, those who are of the household of faith. The book of Galatians and Romans explains that. Now, if you were made of the same stuff, Jesus is saying, if you were made of the same stuff as Abraham, you wouldn't treat me like this. You'd treat me the way Abraham did. Back in Genesis 18, you may remember God appeared to Abraham as a man. And that was Jesus himself in the Old Testament. God appearing to Abraham right before the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. And Abraham bargained and prayed and begged with the Lord to reduce uh, the destruction. And Abraham, did he try to kill the messenger of God? Simple. No. Abraham received him. He made a great meal. He listened with a humble heart. And here, the Pharisees are not listening. In fact, they want to put Jesus, the messenger of God, to death. And so Jesus, in verse 41, says, You do the deeds of your father. And he's speaking to them, of course, of the devil. Now, there was a commercial back in the 70s. And it was before my time, but I've heard about this commercial and seen some of them. And one of them, there was a guy with a hose, Way, spraying down his car, and then it shows his little son spraying down the car. Then it shows the dad with a sponge soaping down the car, and then it shows the little boy following his dad. And then the dad cleans it all off, and it shows the boy with the hose again wiping it all down. And then it shows the dad sitting in the front seat driving the car. Then it shows the little boy in the passenger seat in his car seat <laughs> back in the 70s, sitting there in the front seat next to his dad. And then it shows his dad's hand reaching for the cigarettes. And then it shows the little boy's hand reaching for the cigarettes. 
And the caption at the end of the commercial is, like father, like son. And so in verse 41, Jesus is saying, you Pharisees are just like your father, and you're treating me the way the devil would, and the devil does. The Pharisees said they love God. They proclaimed to be the leaders, the religious, the most uh, holy people. And yet they were the ones who were acting like the devil. How about you and me? Do your actions, do my actions, show that we're actually listening to Jesus in our life? Do we reveal by our character that Jesus is living in us? Do we want more of Jesus in our families, in our work, in, our, in the projects that we're doing with our spare time? Are we following Jesus and living for his agenda, or are we opposing what Jesus is doing in our lives and in our families and in those around us? Because we're focused on ourselves. So who is your father in the sense of how are you acting and how are you living? And that reveals your spiritual state. Now the Jews in Jesus' day really believed they could go to heaven, and they would, just because they were born into a religious home. And people still think like this today. Oh, I'm right with God because, you know, I went to a Lutheran school, or I was baptized when I was a baby in the Catholic Church, or my parents are Baptist, and, and I was raised, and my grandfather built a church 50 years ago. Well, that's really nice, but what about your faith? What about your relationship with Jesus Christ? God calls us to personal faith, to turn from our sin and put our trust in Jesus. Now, Abraham was one who believed in God's promises, and because he believed, God counted it to him for righteousness. And then his life proved it by his choices of obedience, by his works. And so we can now be spiritually sons and daughters of Abraham without having a drop, a drop of Jewish blood in our system, simply by faith, by believing in God's promises and acting like it. You know, Abraham was looking ahead to Jesus and we're looking back to Jesus, but it's all by faith and that's how we're saved. From the beginning, it's all a genuine faith that then results in actions, submitting to God, living for God. That's the evidence that you're actually a child of God. Now here's a question. Why did most religious people in that day or leaders reject him? Why did they reject him? Jesus looked, identified the reason in verse 37. Look again at 37. He says, because my word has no place in you. <clears throat> so the tragic thing was that they didn't listen to God's word. They wouldn't regard God's word. The phrase means to make room for God's word in your heart. And they wouldn't do that. And remember, these are the religious people who learned the scriptures, who memorized the scriptures, who knew it all up here, but they were not letting it take that 18-inch drop to their heart. They were not actually receiving the word of God. And Jesus said, my word has no place in you. So this is a challenge for us. How do we approach the word of God? Colossians 3 puts it like this, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Are you letting the word of God dwell in you richly? Does it have its rightful place in your heart? Not just in your mind, but in your heart and in your life. Have you given the word of God the place of honor that it deserves in your life? And if you brush it off and you pick and choose parts of the Bible that you like, well, that shows that you're more like the Pharisees. And we can end up rejecting Jesus, his work in our life, and resisting the truth, and missing out on the, the life and the grace and the love that he wants to pour into our lives. So we need to make room for the word of God. Otherwise, we can become opposers like the Pharisees to God and his work. Now, let's go on to verse 41 there. It says, you do the deeds of your father. And so they start hurling insults. Look at verse 41. <laughs> They said to him, we were not born of fornication. We have one father, God. Now that is a sharp and personal insult. It's getting personal. Jesus, uh, and they're really trying to provoke him. We were not born of sexual sin. We were not born of promiscuity or fornication like you. And they're pouring scorn on the reality that Jesus was born of a virgin. And you can understand, maybe there was confusion in those days, but they weren't asking, they weren't interested 
They weren't believing that Jesus was born of a virgin, so they simply mocked him. Now, the truth is, Jesus' birth was the most holy and inspired by God birth in all of history because Mary had a miracle child while she was a virgin, faithful and waiting for her husband. But they spin it all into a scandal and into shameful lies that Jesus is nothing more than a product of sexual immorality. And then they double down on the insult. Do you see that? We have one father, God. (laughs) They couldn't be more wrong about Jesus and about themselves. They're just lies and it's verbal abuse. Now, how does Jesus respond to to lies and verbal abuse? How do we respond? Maybe we, we think we have to fight fire with fire. We have to punch back. Well, look at Jesus' calm and truth-filled response in verse 42. Jesus said to them, If God were your father, you would love me. For I proceeded forth and came from God. Nor have I come of myself, but he sent me. Why do you not understand my speech? Because you're not able to listen to my word. So Jesus calmly responds with two truths. Number one, I've come from God which means if you're really from God, you would love me. But number two, why do you not understand? Jesus says, you're not listening to my word. (coughs) It's kind of cool that Jesus refused to get provoked by their animosity and by their insults. Jesus didn't resort to mudslinging. He responds by staying calm, peaceful, but he's not a doormat. He speaks the truth back, and he speaks it with grace, but also with truth. Remember, Jesus is that perfect representation of the Father. And so we know that Jesus here is acting like the Father. He's showing grace and truth, even in that moment of opposition. And I'm sure that the crowd saw the difference. And you know, this isn't in my notes, but... It's a good warning for us as believers, and let me just say, for dads especially, we get the opportunity to represent the Father. That's a scary calling. It's a high calling. But if we resort to blowing up and to mudslinging and to anger and temper, that's going to rub down. Even if that child is having one of those moments where they they really are pressing all the buttons and they are lying and, and being, you know, disrespectful. It gets, gets me wound up sometimes, but can we respond like Jesus did? If we are close to the Lord and if we're spending time with Jesus, then we can still represent the Father like Jesus does here, even when we're opposed, even when the truth is being spun in our face. And so the call is to, for us to be close to the Lord, and we need Jesus' help so we can be that good representation of the Father to our kids and to those who look up to us, not just our children, but we can be father figures, all of us men. That's needed in this world, and people look up to us as, as, as that more than we think. And so let's be those who represent the Lord. Now look at Jesus' truth claim that he says in verse 42. He said, I proceeded forth and came from God, nor have I come from myself, but he sent me. So Jesus is making a truth claim about his nature and his mission. Another one, John chapter 8, has many. And over the last couple weeks as we've studied it, I've counted the whole chapter at least 12 unique claims that Jesus made about his nature and his deity. And so just to kind of zoom out and and see the whole of chapter 8, let's make that list up on the screen. Back in verse 12, Jesus said, I am the light of God. The world and that meant that he was messiah and that he was divine and you can see that in verse 12 then look over at verse 24 again jesus says i am and the word he is in italics meaning it's not there in the original we talked about this on thursday night the bible study jesus said in verse 24 therefore i said to you that you will die in your sins for if you do not believe that i am you will die in your sins. He was claiming to be the I am of God, God in the flesh, and that we must believe him. And then because if we don't believe, we'll die in our sins, look at number three, truth claim up on the screen. Jesus was saying he's the exclusive savior from sin. 
And then number four, verse 28, he was perfectly in sync with the Father. And then number five, verse 32, Jesus said he's the one who brings truth. And then in verse 36, he said he's the one who brings freedom. Now that's what we've covered in the previous sermons on John 8. Now we can add a few more truth claims made by Christ at the end of the chapter. Verse 42, he said he came from God. He said it three times. I proceeded forth in the New King James from God. I came from God. And then he said, not from myself, but he sent me. So Jesus was very clear. He did not believe he was just a regular guy who decided to appoint himself as Messiah. He knew he came down from heaven, from the right hand of the Father. He knew that he's the eternal Son who came forth from the eternal Father and that he was sent by the Father to save us. So Jesus was 100% human, but also 100% God at the same time. And that's why the virgin birth of Christ is an essential doctrine. Because if Christ wasn't born a virgin then he would be a sinner like us and he couldn't be our savior. So Jesus had to be sinless. And Jesus knew and he claimed that he was born of a virgin and he was sent to earth by God. He proceeded from the Father. Now that's a very strong truth claim. Either Jesus is right or he's wrong. It's true or it's a lie. There's no middle ground here. And then look at verse 44. There's more. Jesus has more to say about who the Pharisees really are. Verse 44, you are of your father, the devil, and the desires of your father you want to do. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks it from his own resources for he is a liar and the father of it. Verse 45, but because I tell the truth, you do not believe me. Now, Jesus was calm and collected, but when he spoke the truth to the Pharisees, he didn't sugarcoat his words. I know you guys think you're so religious and you're educated and respected, but even though you hold these positions of prestige and authority, you are actually of your father, the devil, said Jesus. And you do the desires that your father wants you to do. Oh, oh, you want to bring up parentage? You're saying that I'm from uh, fornication. You're from the devil. And your works are inspired by Satan. And remember, Jesus wasn't going out to attack the Pharisees. He was just teaching the common people. And they came to attack him. And now Jesus responds, calm, but with truth. And you know, it might sound a little bit crazy that Jesus would look at those Pharisees and say, you're of your father, the devil. Like, surely that's not very... Uh, <laughs> not very kind. No, that's good. You're going to offend them. And sometimes we think of evangelism a little differently than Jesus did. <laughs> oh, I've got to be really, you know, nice person all the time. I've got to, got to make sure I never offend. Well, the, the truth offends. And Jesus loves them so much that he's willing to say the truth. And I think if we could act like Jesus in evangelism. We, we need the Holy Spirit. We need the boldness from God. We need the truth of the word. We need wisdom when and where. But we have to say things that offend because the gospel does offend. Not, not we offending with our attitude and our you know, pride and arrogance, but, but humbly, truthfully, I love you so much, I'm going to tell you right now, hell is a real place. And, and you are a sinner just like I am, and you need to be forgiven just like I am. And that offends people, but it's the truth. And Jesus loves them that he's going so much that he's going to speak that truth. Now, here's a question for you. <clears throat> this is debated, sadly, in churches today. It's pretty clear. Did Jesus believe in an actual, literal devil? It's pretty clear. You're of your father, the devil. You do the works he did. And look at verse uh, 44 again. He was a murderer from the beginning and doesn't stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks it from his own resources for he is a liar and the father of it. Jesus knows he's God. <laughs> he knows the devil's a real person. He was there in heaven when Lucifer, a gifted angel, was lifted up in pride and wanted to be worshipped and Lucifer was cast out of heaven. 
And when Jesus came down to earth and started his ministry, the Holy Spirit drove the Lord to the wilderness. He fasted and prayed and prepared. But the devil came and tempted Jesus in the wilderness. Jesus knew Satan is a literal demonic being. And we have to remember this from day to day because we live in a physical world. We see all the things, but we don't see the spiritual realm. And we have to remember there is a real malevolent spiritual being who opposes God, God's work in us and our lives and in God's people. And Satan has a lot of power, a lot of intelligence, a lot of demonic spirits who are organized and motivated to destroy people's lives and to enslave people in sin and to rob people of their God-given purpose. Notice again, verse 44, he's a murderer and he's a liar. What's Satan's goal? It's destruction of our lives and of our families. And what's Satan's tactic? It's deception. And it always has been. And here's the thing. If we believe Satan's lies, then he can destroy us even without touching us because he can make us destroy ourselves because we are deceived. And we can open up our lives to demonic power if we're not careful. You know, God gives us choices but he also gives us the truth right here. Again, is the, does the word of God have a place in your heart? Because this is how you can tell the difference between a lie and deception and truth. And if we ever think, here's an example of a lie of Satan. <laughs> if you ever think for a moment, I don't really think there is a real Satan out there. Hey, he's got you on the most elementary lie there is. And as soon as you do that, you open yourself up to so much more. Because if you think you're smarter and there is no devil, now so many more lies are going to be accepted. As soon as we let our guard down, we start fighting his battle in the flesh. We start fighting with physical means and in the physical realm, and we cannot resist the devil in our own power. We need to rely on God. We need to submit to God and then resist the devil through prayer, and then he will flee from you. And, and just here's another lie. I'm just going to give you the, what I, that's the number one lie. He doesn't exist. <laughs> Number two lie is what he does is he switches around good and evil. And he tells us all the time what is evil and harmful is actually good for you. And what is good and evil is actually harmful for you. And isn't that the rationale of sin and of of pride that tempts every one of us every day? Every time there's a temptation, we start thinking what's evil is good and what's good is evil. Isaiah chapter 5 says, Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. That's a demonic deception. And Satan spins what is right and what is wrong and turns it around every day. And when we buy into it, we destroy ourselves. And Satan's laughing and he's got control. Now, at the same time, we have to remember that Satan is not God's opposite. It's not like there's God over here and Satan up here and they're equally, you know, 50-50 in a battle. Satan was one of the angels created by God. God is so much greater. And greater is he who is in us than he who is in the world. He's given us the word of God. He's given us the truth. He's given us prayer. And he's come to dwell in us by the Holy Spirit when we believe in Jesus Christ. And we can overcome every demonic lie. So Jesus looks at the leaders of the Jewish religion who opposed him and he called them the children of the devil, because they were promoting lies and they were destroying people just like the father of lies himself. Now, when Jesus said this, was Jesus condemning them forever? Was he saying there's no hope for you? (laughs) No, actually, Jesus was giving them the truth so they could change. Look at verse 46. Which of you convicts me of sin? And there's Jesus claiming that he was without sin. That's another truth claim. We'll come back to that in a moment. But he says, and he's basically saying, you can trust me because I don't sin. And then he says, if I tell the truth, why do you not believe me? So there's the key. You can change if you just believe me, guys. Verse 47, he who is of God hears God's words. Therefore, you do not hear because you are not of God. So Jesus gives his opponents correction, but also the opportunity to turn to him, to turn the course of their life, to get right with God. So here's the question today. How can a person become a true child of God? Jesus said, hear God's words in verse 47, 
and believe in me in verse 46. That's it. That's how you can become a child of God. Even if you've sold your life to lies and to destruction and to the devil in the past, you can turn and be forgiven by taking the word of God into your heart and believing on Christ as your savior. That's what Jesus said. And if they, the Pharisees, had just listened and done what Jesus said, they would have turned their lives around and been saved. So the Bible never says to us, if you're living under the control of the devil, it's over for you, you're done. The Bible doesn't say that. It says God desires no one to perish, but all people to come to, to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. It tells us that God is patient and he gives us so many opportunities to repent and to believe. And God loves you so much, he sent his son to die for you. Look at John 1, 12. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, to those who believe in his name. So you can change your family. There's a family of the devil and there's a family of God and you can decide. No matter how much sin, no matter how much mess and destruction, the door is wide open for you into the family of God. Just receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and your Savior. Now, did the Pharisees do that? <laughs> what do you think? Did they humbly respond? Oh, yeah, you know what? We're sorry, Jesus. No, look at verse 48. More shots fired, I call at this point. Then the Jews answered and said to him, Do we not say rightly, you are a Samaritan and you have a demon? And Jesus answered, I do not have a demon, but I honor my father and you dishonor me. And I do not seek my own glory, but there is one who seeks and judges. So the Pharisees respond with anger and with loathing. Jesus, you're a Samaritan. They were considered heretics and they were despised. It's the lowest insult in that culture. And they just label Jesus as that. And then they say, you have a demon. So they said, Dem you're demon possessed, Jesus. <laughs> but again, Jesus doesn't blow up. He calmly responds with truth in verse 49. And Jesus says, look at the fruit. I honor God. If I was demon possessed, would I honor the Father? And Jesus himself, his life, he was not self-seeking. He wasn't twisting scripture. He was humble. He was living out the word of God. And he was honoring the Father. And so he says in verse 50, I do not seek my own glory. There's one who seeks and judges. There's one God who will have the final say on this. And I don't have to win this argument right now because God's going to win. <laughs> God's going to prove it all one day. But you guys, you need to turn your hearts and, and open your heart to me and repent. Verse 51, most assuredly, I say to you, if anyone keeps my word, he shall never see death. So in verse 51, now Jesus looks at them again and appeals to them and says, you can have eternal life if you trust in me, if you keep my word. And this is another truth claim about who Jesus is, that he came to give eternal life. He said, if anyone believes and keeps my word, they shall never see death. So that's the message of hope, is receive Jesus Christ and eternal life. Now let's go back to that list. The whole chapter has all these truth claims. And the eighth one was back in verse 46. I said we'd come back to it. Jesus claimed to be without sin in this chapter. He said, which of you convicts me of sin? And Jesus was trustworthy because he was sinless. And then the ninth truth claim is there in verse 51 that he came to save us from eternal death, that he gives eternal life. Jesus claimed if we keep his word, we'll never see eternal death. And you guys, that doesn't mean we won't die and suffer with a sickness or a disease or an illness or a tragedy. But what it means is even death now is a doorway into glory. For those who believe, even death is an opportunity to go and be with the Lord because he's forgiven our sins. Now that claim in verse 51 is another claim of deity that Jesus believed and said that he was God in the flesh. He was God the Son. Because no mere prophet would say this. Think about it. Abraham, his message was keep God's word. Moses' message was keep God's word. David's message was keep God's word. The prophets keep God's word. Jesus says, keep my word and you'll have eternal life because he's God. Do you see? It's so clear. Jesus claimed 
that his life is found, that, that eternal life is found not just in obeying God, but in obeying him because he is God and trusting him. And so we see that Jesus claims about his deity. They're just accumulating in this chapter alone. This is just one chapter of the Bible. Did Jesus claim to be God? Over and over and over again. Sometimes you read books or blogs. I saw one this week. Three times Jesus claimed to be God. And it's good. There, are, there were at least three times. I, I see more <laughs> just in this chapter. Look at verse 52 because there's more coming. Jesus now claims that he's greater than Abraham. Look at verse 52. Then the Jews said to him, Now we know that you have a demon. Abraham is dead and the prophets, and you say, If anyone keeps my word, he shall never taste death. Are you greater than our father Abraham, who is dead, and the prophets are dead? Who do you make yourself out to be? And that's the real question of this chapter. Jesus, who do you make yourself out to be? Verse 54, Jesus answered, If I honor myself, my honor is nothing. It is my Father who honors me, of whom you say that he is your God. Yet you have not known him, but I know him. And if I say I do not know him, I shall be a liar like you. But I do know him and I keep his word. So Jesus is saying again, guys, I'm fine with my relationship with God. But let me answer your question from back in verse 53. Am I greater than Abraham? Well, Jesus says in verse 56, here's the answer. Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day. And he, was, and he saw it and he was glad. So there's the answer. Is Jesus greater than Abraham? Yes. If he was just a Jewish prophet, or if Jesus was just a good teacher or a rabbi, that would be blasphemy. No one is greater than Abraham. Abraham's the one through whom God started the Jewish nation and all monotheistic faith in the whole world. And only one is greater than Abraham, and that's God himself. And so Jesus said, Abraham, rejoice to see my day. Abraham was happy to see me, and he looked up to me, and he worshipped me. And so here's the next truth claim, number 10, that verse 56, Jesus claimed to be greater than Abraham. So when did Abraham see Jesus' day? Well, Abraham lived some 2,000 years before Jesus was born to Mary. <laughs> so how is it possible that Jesus saw Abraham's day 2,000 years before Jesus came to earth that we know as a baby? Well, here's the deal. If Jesus is the eternal Son of God, if he is God the Son, then Jesus was present in the days of Abraham. And Abraham understood, and Abraham saw Jesus and he looked forward to Jesus' day, to Jesus being the Messiah. And you know, when we, you read Genesis, and we did, we studied Genesis carefully, I can see at least three times where Abraham encounters the Lord and he looks and he worships Jesus. Of course, the story with Melchizedek, when he said, you're greater than me, and he tithed to him. That was a picture of the Lord or maybe the Lord himself. And then, of course, the time when I mentioned when the Lord appeared and Abraham made a meal for him in Genesis 18. But then I'm also thinking of that time when Abraham was too old and Sarah, they were past having kids and God kept saying, I'm going to give you a nation. How is that possible? And the Lord visited and said, I'm going to give you a child. This time next year, you have a son. Sarah laughed. They ended up calling his name Laughter, Isaac. And then later on in Genesis 22, God said, take your son, your only son who you love, up to the Mount Moriah, and I want you to sacrifice him to me. And it was a great picture of what Jesus is going to do, the father sacrificing the son in the same mountain, Mount Moriah, as Calvary. And of course, God stopped Abraham. He was willing, but God stopped him. And God said, I will provide in this mountain a lamb. And Abraham believed, and, Ab and God brought a ram, and, and Abraham killed it, but he knew that wasn't the one. There was one coming. He believed in Jesus. He looked forward to Jesus. He, he saw ahead Jesus' day, and he rejoiced. And Jesus says, yeah, I am greater than Abraham. Abraham saw my day, and he rejoiced. And he worshiped, and he believed in me. So what does that mean? Well, look at verse 57. Then the Jews said to him, you are not yet 50 years old. And you have seen Abraham? 
So for those of you in your late 40s, that means you're young, according to verse 57. Uh, or in your 50s, there you go, that's, that's young. And Jesus was around 32, 33 years old at this moment. It's interesting they don't say, you're not even 40. They say, you're not even 50. Why? Maybe Jesus looked a little bit worn down by all of this of ministry and the things that were going on in his life. Maybe he looked a bit older than 32 uh, or 33. But still, how can you say you saw Abraham? Well, look at verse 58. Jesus said to them, most assuredly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. Whoa. Now, what did Jesus mean by that? Well, here's another claim, the 11th claim, verse 57 to 58, that he is eternal. That's what he's saying. I've always existed. And you know what? That, that's the first conclusion of that verse, and it's so simple. Jesus said, even before Abraham was, I am. Go back 2,000 years from John 8. That's 4,000 years for us. Jesus says, I'm there. And he didn't say, I was there. He said, I am there. Isn't that interesting? Because Jesus created time back in Genesis chapter 1, and he stands outside of time and eternity and space the way we think of it. He says, even before Abraham was, I'm there. I am. And so Jesus was claiming to be eternally existent, existing outside of time and space as we know it and live in it. And this was a radical claim. And even if that was the only meaning of that statement, that would clearly imply that Jesus believed he was eternal and he was God. Without beginning and without end. That's what eternal means. Only God is eternal. Without beginning and without end. But there's more. <laughs> there's more. Look again at verse 58. Uh, Jesus said to them, most assuredly, before uh, I say to you, before Abraham was, and, and the phrase I am is emphatically stated because it means I am the I am of God. I am God himself. He's invoking the name of God for himself. Not only am I eternal, but I am the God who spoke to Moses in the burning bush and said, I am that I am. I am Yahweh. I am the God of Israel. And here's another claim of Jesus, emphatically, the I am of God in the flesh. He stated it so clearly. He did it seven times with, with a qualifying statement, I am the bread of life, I am the light of the world, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And here he just says, so no one's confused, I am. Even before Abraham, I am. Is Jesus God? <laughs> I think it's pretty clear. And did the people think that he was saying that? Well, look at verse 59. Then they took up stones to throw at him. <laughs> but Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple, going through the midst of them. And so he passed by. So God protected him. It wasn't his time. But why would they want to stone him to death? Because they knew he was claiming to be God. Because this would be blasphemy if any other man said it. But this is God himself. This is Jesus God the Son who's come down. And so even the opponents, even the Pharisees, clearly understood the divinity claim of Christ. And they wanted to kill him. Now today there are many false cults that try to reduce Jesus from whom he clearly said he was. You've got the Jehovah's Witnesses, you've got the Mormon LDS organization, you've got Islam, and you've got others. And they use the name of Jesus in their false teachings, but they deny that Jesus is the divine Son of God. Now remember that phrase, Son of God? And this is how they twist it. They say, oh, God, and then Son of God. He's lower. He's a step lower. No, no, that's not what the phrase Son of God means. It means in the very essence of God, in the very nature of God. Remember John's nickname was Son of Thunder. He's in the nature of thunder. And so when Jesus was the Son of God, it means he's in the nature of God. He came forth. He proceeded from God. We read that today. He is God in essence, just like the Father. And, you know, we've demonstrated that today at least 12 times. Just in this one chapter, Jesus was claiming divine no, uh, nature for himself. And, you know what, there's still more chapters coming in the Gospel of John, so... You know, here's the thing. In order to be saved, in order to see eternal life, 
you must have a place for God's word in your heart and you must believe who Jesus claimed to be. You must receive him. You must let his word have a home in your heart and you must change your life according to who he is. He is our Lord. He's our Savior. He's God. And nothing less. And we do not reduce that. And you might say, okay, Pastor Colin, we've been in John for a while now. Uh, Every Sunday, Jesus is God. Jesus is God. We, We get it now. But you guys, it's so important because here's the deal. Sin is so bad. The slavery of sin in our life is so strong. The deception of Satan is so real that as humans, we need God himself to save us. Jesus didn't come to just give us some life hacks. Jesus didn't come telling us the way to God. Jesus didn't come with how-to instructions or self-help manual. Jesus came to save us himself because he is God. And that's what we need. We need God to rescue us. We need God himself. And that's why we believe and we see what John teaches and we see what Jesus said. That only Jesus, the divine son of God, who is sinless and eternal, can save us from the power of sin and Satan and make you into a child of God. So as we wrap things up today, chapter 8, A lot of things happening there. And you know, here's the interesting thing. At the beginning of chapter 8, the Pharisees wanted to stone a woman because they had trapped her. And at the end of chapter 8, they want to stone Jesus because he has trapped them in his words. And I love how Jesus just so calmly and so beautifully turns this around. How he stayed patient and calm and presented light and truth. So here's the conclusion today. If you want to end up different than the Pharisees, (laughs) you need to have a soft heart for the Lord to make sure his word is given its rightful place in your daily life and in your heart. And when you make the decision to trust in Jesus as your Savior and your Lord, you will become a child of God, lifted out of the kingdom of darkness, brought into the kingdom of light, not by your power, not by your works, but by God himself, rescuing you. And that's why Jesus came. That's the love of God. How loved are we? (laughs) Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us, that we can be called children of God, that he can change our life so radically, free us from sin, and make us one with him. So if I could summarize the message today, Satan's real. He's a deceiver. He's a destroyer. You can enter God's family We must make room for God's word in our hearts and in our lives, and only Jesus, God the Son, can save us. Let's bow our heads. Lord, we thank you so much that you are speaking to us today. We thank you, Lord, that you love us so much, and you are a good Father. You absolutely love us perfectly, so much that you sent Jesus and made it very clear so many times over who he is, and then that he would die for our sins. Lord, we just say thank you. And thank you that you've forgiven us of our sin. You free us from sin. You give us eternal life simply by turning from our sin and trusting in you. And so we give you our hearts. We give you our lives. Help, you, help us to love you, to love your word, to represent you in this world. We can't do it perfectly. But Lord, help us to be humble about that. And when we mess up, even to apologize. And Lord, to represent you with that hunger and that openness to to want to know God more. Let people see that in all of us. And Lord, help us to really know for sure our relationship with you is so secure, not based on our works and performance, but simply by your grace through faith, we know we're saved. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.